Fyodor Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground, Part 2, Apropos of the Wet Snow. When from dark error's subjugation my words of passionate exhortation had wrenched thy fainting spirit free, and writhing prone in thine affliction, thou did recall with malediction the vice that had encompassed thee. And when thy slumbering conscience, fretting by recollection's torturing flame, thou did reveal the hideous setting of thy life's current ere I came, when suddenly I saw thee sicken, and weeping hide thine anguished face, revolted, maddened, horror-stricken, at memories of foul disgrace. Nekrasov Chapter 1 At that time I was only twenty-four. My life was even then gloomy, ill-regulated, and as solitary as that of a savage. I made friends with no one, and positively avoided talking, and buried myself more and more in my hole. At work, in the office, I never looked at anyone, and was perfectly well aware that my companions looked upon me, not only as a queer fellow, but even looked upon me, I always fancied this, with a sort of loathing. I sometimes wondered why it was that nobody except me fancied that he was looked upon with aversion. One of the clerks had a most repulsive pockmarked face, which looked positively villainous, I believe I should not have dared to look at anyone with such an unsightly countenance. Another had such a very dirty old uniform that there was an unpleasant odor in his proximity. Yet not one of these gentlemen showed the slightest self-consciousness, either about their clothes or their countenance or their character in any way. Neither of them ever imagined that they were looked at with repulsion. If they had imagined it, they would not have minded so long as their superiors did not look at them that way. It is clear to me now that, owing to my unbounded vanity, and to the high standard I set for myself, I often looked at myself with furious discontent, which verged on loathing, and so I inwardly attributed the same feeling to everyone. I hated my face, for instance. I thought it disgusting, and even suspected that there was something base in my expression, and so every day when I turned up at the office, I tried to behave as independently as possible, and to assume a lofty expression, so that I might not be suspected of being abject. My face may be ugly, I thought, but let it be lofty, expressive, and above all extremely intelligent. But I was positively and painfully certain that it was impossible for my countenance ever to express those qualities. And what was worst of all, I thought it actually stupid-looking and I would have been quite satisfied if I could have looked intelligent. In fact, I would have even put up with looking base if at the same time my face could have been thought strikingly intelligent. Of course I hated my fellow clerks, one and all, and I despised them all, yet at the same time I was, as it were, afraid of them. In fact, it happened at times that I thought more highly of them than of myself. It somehow happened quite suddenly that I alternated between despising them and thinking them superior to myself. A cultivated and decent man cannot be vain without setting a fearfully high standard for himself, and without despising and almost hating himself at certain moments. But whether I despised them or thought them superior, I dropped my eyes almost every time I met anyone. I even made experiments whether I could face so-and-so looking at me, and I was always the first to drop my eyes. This worried me to distraction. I had a sickly dread, too, of being ridiculous, and so had a slavish passion for the conventional in everything external. I loved to fall into the common rut, and had a wholehearted terror of any kind of eccentricity in myself. But how could I live up to it? I was morbidly sensitive as a man of our age should be. They were all stupid, and as like as one another as so many sheep. Perhaps I was the only one in the office who fancied that I was a coward and a slave, and I fancied it just because I was more highly developed. But it was not only that I fancied it, it really was so. I was a coward and a slave. I say this without the slightest embarrassment. Every decent man of our age must be a coward and a slave. That is his normal condition. Of that I am firmly persuaded. 
He is made and constructed to that very end, and not only at the present time owing to some casual circumstances, but always, at all times, a decent man is bound to be a coward and a slave. It is the law of nature for all decent people all over the earth. If any one of them happens to be valiant about something, he need not be comforted nor carried away by that. He would show the white feather just the same before something else. That is how it is invariably and inevitably ends. Only donkeys and mules are valiant, and they only till they are pushed up to the wall. It is not worth while to pay attention to them, for they really are of no consequence. Another circumstance, too, worried me in those days, that there was no one like me, and I was unlike anyone else. I am alone, and they are everyone, I thought, and pondered. From that, it is evident that I was still a youngster. The very opposite sometimes happened. It was loathsome sometimes to go to the office. Things reached such a point that I often ha came home ill. But all at once, apropos of nothing, there would come a phase of skepticism and indifference. Everything happened in phases to me. And I would laugh myself at my intolerance and fastidiousness. I would reproach myself with being romantic. At one time I was unwilling to speak to anyone, while at other times I would not only talk, but go to the length of contemplating making friends with them. All my fastidiousness would suddenly, for no rhyme or reason, vanish. Who knows, perhaps I never really had it and it had simply been affected and got out of books. I have not decided that question, even now. Once I quite made friends with them, visited their homes, played preference, drank vodka, talked of promotions. But here, let me make a digression. We Russians, speaking generally, have never had those foolish, transcendental romantics, German, and still more French, on whom nothing produces any effect. If there were an earthquake, if all France perished at the barricades, they would still be the same. They would not even have the decency to effect a change, but would still go on singing their transcendental song to the hour of their death, because they are fools. We in Russia have no fools. That is well known. That is what distinguishes us from foreign lands. Consequently, these transcendental natures are not found amongst us in their pure form. The idea that they are is due to our realistic journalists and critics of that day, always on the lookout for Kostanoglos and Uncle Paitor Ivanoviches, and foolishly accepting them as our ideal. They have slandered our romantics, taking them for the same transcendental sort as in Germany or France. On the contrary, the characteristics of our romantics are absolutely and directly opposed to the transcendental European type and no European standard can be applied to them. Allow me to make use of this word romantic, an old-fashioned and much-respected word, which has done good service and is familiar to all. The characteristics of our romantic are to understand everything, to see everything, and to see it often incomparably more clearly than our most realistic minds see it, to refuse to accept anyone or anything, but at the same time not to despise anything, to give way, to yield from policy, never to lose sight of a useful practical object, such as rent-free quarters at the government's expense, pensions, decorations, to keep their eye on the object through all the enthusiasms and volumes of lyrical poems, and at the same time to preserve the sublime and the beautiful inviolate within them to the hour of their death, and to preserve themselves also incidentally, like some precious jewel wrapped in cotton wool, if only for the benefit of the sublime and the beautiful. Our romantic is a man of great breadth, and the greatest rogue of all our rogues, I assure you. I can assure you from experience, indeed. Of course, that is, if he is intelligent. But what am I saying? The romantic is always intelligent, and I only meant to observe that although we have foolish romantics, they don't count, and they were only so because in the flower of their youth they degenerated into Germans, and to preserve their precious jewel more comfortably, settled somewhere out there by preference in Weimar or the Black Forest. 
I, for instance, genuinely despise my official work, and did not openly abuse it simply because I was in it myself and got a salary for it. Anyway, take note, I did not openly abuse it. Our romantic would rather go out of his mind, a thing, however, which very rarely happens, than take open abuse unless he had some other career in view, and he is never kicked out. At most, they would take him to the lunatic asylum as the king of Spain if she should go very mad. But it is only the thin, fair people who go out of their minds in Russia. Innumerable romantics attain later in life to considerable rank in the service. Their many-sidedness is remarkable, and what a faculty they have for the most contradictory sensations! I was comforted by this thought even in those days, and I am of the same opinion now. That is why there are so many broad natures among us who never lose their ideal even in the depths of degradation, and though they never stir a finger for their ideal, though they are errant thieves and knaves, yet they tearfully cherish their first ideal and are extraordinarily honest at heart. Yes, it is only among us that the most incorrigible rogue can be absolutely and loftily honest at heart without in the least ceasing to be a rogue. I repeat, our romantics frequently become such accomplished rascals, I use the term rascals affectionately, suddenly display such a sense of reality and practical knowledge that their bewildered superiors and the public generally can only ejaculate in amazement. Their many-sidedness is really amazing, and goodness knows what it may develop into later on, and what the future has in store for us. It is not a poor material. I do not say this from any foolish or boastful patriotism, but I feel sure that you are again imagining that I am joking. Or perhaps it is just the contrary, and you convince that I really think so. Anyway, gentlemen, I shall welcome both views as an honor and as a special favor, and do forgive my digression. I did not, of course, maintain friendly relations with my comrades, and soon was at loggerheads with them, and in my youth and inexperience I even gave up bowing to them, as though I had cut off all relations. That, however, only happened to me once. As a rule, I was always alone. In the first place, I spent most of my time at home reading. I tried to stifle all that was continually seething within me by means of external impressions, and the only external means I had was reading. Reading, of course, was a great help, exciting me, giving me pleasure and pain, but at times it bored me fearfully. One longed for movement in spite of everything. I plunged all at once into dark, underground, loathsome vice of the pettiest kind. My wretched passions were acute, smarting from my continual, sickly irritability. I had hysterical impulses with tears and convulsions. I had no resource except reading, that is, there was nothing in my surrounding which I could respect and which attracted me. I was overwhelmed with depression, too. I had an hysterical craving for incongruity and for contrast, and so I took to vice. I have not said all this to justify myself, <laughs> but no, I am lying. I did want to justify myself. I make that little observation for my own benefit, gentlemen. I do not want to lie. I vowed to myself I would not. And so furtively, timidly, in solitude, at night, I indulged in filthy vice, and with a feeling of shame which never deserted me, even at the most loathsome moments, and which at such moments nearly made me curse. Already, even then, I had my underground world in my soul. I was fearfully afraid of being seen, of being met, of being recognized. I visited various obscure haunts. One night, as I was passing a tavern, I saw through a lighted window some gentlemen fighting with billiard cues, and saw one of them thrown out of the window. At other times, I should have felt very much disgusted, but I was in such a mood at the time that I actually envied the gentleman thrown out of the window, and I envied him so much that I even went into the tavern and into the billiard room. Perhaps, I thought, I'll have a fight too, and they'll throw me out of the window. I was not drunk, but what is one to do? Depression will drive a man to such a pitch of hysteria. But nothing happened. It seemed that I was not even equal to being thrown out of the window, and I went away without having my fight. An officer put me in my place from the first moment. 
I was standing by the billiard table, and in my ignorance, blocking up the way, and he wanted to pass. He took me by the shoulders, and without a word, without a warning or explanation, he moved me from where I was standing to another spot, and passed as though he had not noticed me. I could have forgiven blows, but I could not forgive his having moved me without noticing me. Devil knows what I would have given for a real, regular quarrel, a more decent, more literary one, so to speak. I had been treated like a fly. This officer was over six foot, well, I was a spindly little fellow. But the quarrel was in my hands. I had only to protest, and I certainly would have been thrown out of the window. But I changed my mind, and preferred to beat a resentful retreat. I went out of the tavern straight home, confused and troubled, and the next night I went out again with the same lewd intentions, still more furtively, abjectly, and miserably than before, as it were, with tears in my eyes. But still, I did go out again. Don't imagine, though, it was a cowardice that made me slink away from the officer. I have never been a coward at heart, though I have always been a coward in action. Don't be in a hurry to laugh. I assure you I can explain it all. Oh, if only that officer had been one of the sort who would consent to fight a duel. But no, he was one of those gentlemen, alas, long extinct, who prepared fighting with cues, or, like Gogol's Lieutenant Pirogov, appealing to the police. They did not fight duels, and would have thought, a duel with a civilian like me an utterly unseemly procedure in any case, and they looked upon the duel altogether as something impossible, something free-thinking and French. But they were quite ready to bully, especially when they were over six foot. I did not slink away through cowardice, but through an unbounded vanity. I was afraid not of his six foot, not of getting a sound thrashing and being thrown out of the window. I should have had physical courage enough, I assure you. But I had not the moral courage. What I was afraid was that everyone present, from the insolent marker down to the lowest little stinking pimply clerk in a greasy collar would jeer at me and fail to understand when I began to protest and to address them in literary language. For of the point of honour, not of honour, but of the point of honour, point de honneur, one cannot speak among us except in literary language. You cannot allude to the point of honour in ordinary language. I was fully convinced, the sense of reality in spite of all my romanticism, that they would all simply split their sides with laughter, and that the officer would not simply beat me, that is, without insulting me, but would certainly prod me in the back with his knee and kick me around the billiard table, and only then, perhaps, have pity and drop me out of the window. Of course, this trivial incident could not with me end in that. I often met that officer afterwards in the street and noticed him very carefully. I am not quite sure whether he recognized me. I imagine not. I judged from certain signs. But I... I stared at him with spite and hatred, and so it went on for several years. My resentment grew even deeper with years. At first I began making stealthy inquiries about this officer. It was difficult for me to do so, for I knew no one. But one day I heard someone shout his surname in the street as I was following him at a distance, as though I were tied to him, and so I learnt his surname. Another time I followed him to his flat, and for ten kopecks learned from the porter where he lived, on which story, whether he lived alone or with others, and so on. In fact, everything one could learn from a porter. One morning, though I had never tried my hand with a pen, it suddenly occurred to me to write a satire on this officer in the form of a novel which would unmask his villainy. I wrote the novel with relish. I did unmask his villainy. I even exaggerated it. At first I so altered his surname that it could be easily recognized, but on second thoughts I changed it and sent the story to the Ochechkevinya Zapinski. But at that time such attacks were not in the fashion, and my story was not printed. That was a great vexation to me. Sometimes I positively choked with resentment. At last I determined to challenge my enemy to a duel. I composed a splendid, charming letter to him, imploring him to apologize to me, and hinting rather plainly at a duel in case of refusal. The letter was so composed that if the officer had had the least understanding of the sublime and the beautiful, he would certainly have flung himself on my neck 
and offered me his friendship. How fine that would have been! How we should have got on together! He could have shielded me with his higher rank, while I could have improved his mind with my culture and, well, my ideas, and all sorts of things might have happened. Only fancy. This was two years after his insult to me, and my challenge would have been a ridiculous anachronism, in spite of all the ingenuity of my letter in disguising and explaining away the anachronism. But, thank God, to this day I thank the Almighty with tears in my eyes, I did not send a letter to him. Cold shivers run down my back when I think what might have happened if I had sent it. And all at once, I revenged myself in the simplest way, by a stroke of genius. A brilliant thought suddenly dawned upon me. Sometimes on holidays I used to stroll along the sunny side of the Nevsky about four o'clock in the afternoon, though it was hardly a stroll so much as a series of innumerable miseries, humiliations, and resentments, but no doubt that was just what I wanted. I used to wriggle along in a most unseemly fashion like an eel, continually moving aside to make way for generals, for officers, of the guard, and the hussars, and for the ladies. At such minutes there used to be a convulsive twinge at my heart, and I used to feel hot all down my back at the mere thought of the wretchedness of my attire, of the wretchedness and abjectness of my little scurrying figure. This was a regular martyrdom, a continual intolerable humiliation at the thought, which passed into an incessant and direct sensation that I was merely a fly in the eye of all this world, a nasty, disgusting fly, more intelligent, more highly developed, more refined in feeling than any of them, of course, but a fly that was continually making way for everyone, insulted and injured by everyone. Why I inflicted this torture on myself, why I went to the Nevsky, I don't know. I simply felt drawn there at every possible opportunity. Already, then, I began to experience a rush of in the enjoyment of which I spoke in the first chapter. After my affair with the officer, I felt even more drawn there than before. It was on the Nevsky that I met him most frequently. There I could admire him. He, too, went there chiefly on holidays. He, too, turned out of his path for generals and persons of higher rank, and he, too, wriggled between them like an eel. But people like me, or even better dressed than me, he simply walked over. He made straight for them as though there was nothing but empty space before him, and never, under any circumstance, turned aside. I gloated over my resentment watching him, and always resentfully made way for him. It exasperated me that even in the street I could not be on an even footing with him. Why must you invariably be the first to move aside? I kept asking myself in a hysterical rage, waking up sometimes at three o'clock in the morning. Why is it you and not he? There's no regulation about it. There's no written law. Let the making way be equal as it usually is when refined people meet. He moved halfway and you move halfway. You pass with mutual respect. But that never happened, and I always moved aside, well, he did not even notice my making way for him. And lo and behold, a bright idea dawned upon me. What, I thought, if I meet him and don't move on one side? What if I don't move aside on purpose, even if I knock up against him? How would that be? This audacious idea took such a hold on me that it gave me no peace. I was dreaming of it continually, horribly, and I purposely went more frequently to the Nevsky in order to picture more vividly how I should do it when I did do it. I was delighted. This intention seemed to be more and more practical and possible. Of course, I shall not really push him, I thought, already more good-natured in my joy. I will simply not turn aside. We'll run up against him, not very violently, but just shouldering each other just as much as decency permits. I will push against him just as much as he pushes against me. At last I made up my mind completely, but my preparations took a great deal of time. To begin with, when I carried out my plan, I should need to be looking rather more decent, and so I had to think of my get-up. In case of emergency, if, for instance, there were any sort of public scandal, and the public there is of the most recherché, the Countess walks there, Prince Blue walks there, and all the literary world is there. I must be well-dressed. That inspires respect, 
and of itself puts us on equal footing in the eyes of society. With this object, I asked for some of my salary in advance and bought a, at Cherkin's a pair of black gloves and a decent hat. Black gloves seemed to me both more dignified and bon ton than the lemon-colored ones which I had contemplated at first. The color is too gaudy, it looks as though one were trying to be conspicuous, and I did not take the lemon-colored ones. I had got ready long beforehand a good shirt with some white bone studs. My overcoat was the only thing that held me back. The coat in itself was a very good one. It kept me warm. But it was wadded, and it had a raccoon collar, which was the height of vulgarity. I had to change the collar at any sacrifice, and to have a beaver one like an officer's. For this purpose, I be began visiting the Gostany Dvor, and after several attempts, I pitched upon a piece of cheap German beaver. Though these German beavers soon grow shabby and look wretched, yet at first they look exceedingly well, and I only needed it for the occasion. I asked the price. Even so, it was too expensive. After thinking it over thoroughly, I decided to sell my raccoon collar. The rest of the money, a considerable sum for me, I decided to borrow from Anton Antonich Setchotchkin, my immediate superior, an unassuming person, though grave and judicious. He never lent money to anyone, but I had, on entering the service, been especially recommended to him by an important personage who had got me my berth. I was horribly worried. To borrow from Anton Antonich seemed to me monstrous and shameful. I did not sleep for two or three nights. Indeed, I did not sleep well at that time. I was in a fever. I had a vague sinking at my heart, or else a sudden throbbing, throbbing throbbing. Anton Antonich was surprised at first, then he frowned, then he reflected, and did, after all, lend me the money, receiving from me a written authorization to take from my salary a fortnight later the sum he had lent me. In this way everything was at last ready. The handsome beaver replaced the mean-looking raccoon, and I began by degrees to get to work. It would never have done to act offhand, at random, the plan had to be carried out skillfully, by degrees. But I must confess that after many efforts I began to despair. We simply could not run into each other. I made every preparation. I was quite determined. It seemed as though we should run into one another directly, and before I knew what I was doing, I had stepped aside for him, and he had passed without noticing me. I even prayed as I approached him that God would grant me determination. One time I had made up my mind thoroughly but it ended in my stumbling and falling at his feet, because at the very last instance, when I was six inches from him, my courage failed me. He very calmly stepped over me, while I flew on one side like a ball. That night I was ill again, feverish and delirious, and suddenly it ended most happily. The night before, I had made up my mind not to carry out my fatal plan and to abandon it all, and with that object, I went in the Nevsky for the last time just to see how I would abandon it all. Suddenly, three paces from my enemy, I unexpectedly made up my eye mind. I closed my eyes, and we ran full tilt, shoulder to shoulder, up against one another. I did not budge an inch and passed him on a perfectly equal footing. He did not even look round and pretended not to notice it. But he was only pretending. I am convinced of that. I am convinced of it to this day. Of course, I got the worst of it. He was stronger, but that's not the point. The point was that I had attained my object. I had kept up my dignity. I had not yielded a step, and had put myself publicly on an equal social footing with him. I returned home feeling that I was fully avenged of everything. I was delighted. I was triumphant and sang Italian arias. Of course, I will not describe to you what happened to me three days later. If you have read my first chapter, you can guess for yourself. The officer was afterwards transferred. I have not seen him now for fourteen years. What is the dear fellow doing now? Whom is he walking over? End Part 2 Chapter 1 Fyodor Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground Part 2 Chapter 2 But the period of my dissipation would end, and I always felt very sick afterwards. It was followed by remorse. I tried to drive it away. I felt too sick. By degrees, however, I got used to all that, too. 
I grew used to everything, or rather, I voluntarily resigned myself to enduring it. But I had a means of escape that reconciled everything. That was to find refuge in the sublime and the beautiful. In dreams, of course. I was a terrible dreamer. I would dream for three months on end, tucked away in my corner. And you may believe me that at those moments I had no resemblance to the gentleman who, in the perturbation of his chicken heart, put a collar of German beaver on his greatcoat. I suddenly became a hero. I would not have admitted my six-foot lieutenant, even if he had called on me. I could not even have pictured him before me then. What were my dreams, and how I could satisfy myself with them? It is hard to say now, but at the time I was satisfied with them. Though indeed, even now, I am to some extent satisfied with them. Dreams were particularly sweet and vivid after a spell of dissipation. They came with remorse and with tears and curses and transports. There were moments of such positive intoxication, of such happiness, that there was not the faintest trace of irony within me, on my honor. I had faith, hope, love. I believed blindly at such times that by some miracle, by some external circumstance, all this would suddenly open out, expand, that suddenly a vista of suitable activity, beneficent, good, and above all, ready-made. What sort of activity I had no idea, but the great thing was that it should be all ready for me, would rise up before me, and I could come out into the light of day, almost riding a white horse and crowned with laurel. Anything but the foremost place I could not conceive for myself, and for that very reason I quite contentedly occupied the lowest in reality. Either to be a hero or to grovel in the mud, there was nothing in between. That was my ruin, for when I was in the mud I comforted myself with the thought that at other times I was a hero, and the hero was a cloak for the mud. For an ordinary man it was shameful to defile himself, but a hero was too lofty to be utterly defiled, and so he might defile himself. It is worth noting that these attacks of the sublime and the beautiful visited me even during the period of dissipation, and just at the times when I was touching the bottom. They came in separate spurts, as though reminding me of themselves, but did not banish the dissipation by their appearance. On the contrary, they seemed to add zest to it by contrast, and were only sufficiently present to serve as an appetizing sauce. That sauce was made up of contradictions and sufferings, of agonizing inward analysis, and all these pangs and pinpricks gave a certain frequency, even a significance to my dissipation, in fact, completely answered the purpose of an appetizing sauce. There was a certain depth of meaning in it, and I could hardly have resigned myself to the simple, vulgar, direct debauchery of a clerk, and have endured all the filthiness of it. What could have allured me about it then, and have drawn me at night into the street? No, I had a lofty way of getting out of it all. And what loving kindness, oh Lord, what loving kindness I felt at times in those dreams of mine, in those flights into the sublime and the beautiful. Though it was fantastic love, though it was never applied to anything human in reality, yet there was so much of this love that one did not feel afterwards even the impulse to apply it in reality. That would have been superfluous. Everything, however, passed satisfactorily by a lazy and fascinating transition into the sphere of art, that is, into the beautiful forms of life, lying ready, largely stolen from the poets and novelists, and adapted to all sorts of needs and uses. I, for instance, was triumphant over everyone. Everyone, of course, was in dust and ashes, and was forced spontaneously to recognize my superiority, and I forgave them all. I was a poet and a grand gentleman. I fell in love. I came in for countless millions, and immediately devoted them to humanity, and at the same time I confessed before all the people my shameful deeds, which, of course, were not merely shameful, but had in them much that was sublime and beautiful, something in the Manfred style. Everyone would kiss me and weep. What idiots they would have been if they did not. Well, I should go barefoot and hungry, preaching new ideas and fighting victorious Austerlitz against the obscurantists. Then the band would play a march, and amnesty would be declared. The Pope would agree to retire from Rome to Brazil. 
Then there would be a ball for the whole of Italy at the Villa Borghese on the shores of Lake Como, Lake Como being for the purpose transferred to the neighborhood of Rome. Then would come a scene in the bushes, and so on, and so on, as though you did not know all about it. You will say that it is vulgar and contemptible to drag all this into public after all the tears and transports which I myself have confessed. But why is it contemptible? Can you imagine that I am ashamed of it all, and that it was stupider than anything in your life, gentlemen? And I can assure you that some of these fancies were by no means badly composed. It did not happen all on the shores of Lake Como. And yet you're right. It really is vulgar and contemptible. And most contemptible of all is that now I am attempting to justify myself to you. And even more contemptible than that is my making this remark now. But that's enough, or there'll be no end to it. Each step will be more contemptible than the last. I could never stand more than three months of dreaming at a time without feeling an irresistible desire to plunge into society. To plunge into society meant to visit my superior at the office, Anton Antonich Sechotchkin. He was the only permanent acquaintance I have had in my life, and I wonder at this fact now myself. But I only went to see him when that phase came over me, and when my dreams had reached such a point of bliss that it became essential at once to embrace my fellows and all mankind. And for that purpose I needed at least one human being actually existing. I had to call on Anton Antonich, however, on Tuesday, his at-home day, so I had always to time my passionate desire to embrace humanity so that it might fall on a Tuesday. This Anton Antonich lived on the fourth story in a house in five corners, in four low-pitched rooms, one smaller than the other, of a particularly frugal and sallow appearance. He had two daughters and their aunt, who used to pour out the tea. Of the daughters, one was thirteen and another fourteen. They both had snub noses, and I was awfully shy of them because they were always whispering and giggling together. The master of the house usually sat in his study on a leather couch in front of the table with some grey-headed gentlemen, usually a colleague from our office or some other department. I never saw more than two or three visitors there, always the same. They talked about the excise duty, about the business in the Senate, about salaries and promotions, about His Excellency, and the best means of pleasing him, and so on. I had the patience to sit like a fool beside these people for hours at a stretch, listening to them without knowing what to say to them or venturing to say a word. I became stupefied. Several times I felt myself perspiring. I was overcome by a sort of paralysis. But this was pleasant and good for me. On returning home I deferred for a time my desire to embrace all mankind. I had, however, one other acquaintance of a sort, Simonov, who was an old schoolfellow. I had a number of schoolfellows, indeed, in Petersburg, but I did not associate with them, and had even given up nodding to them in the street. I believe I had transferred into the department I was in simply to avoid their company, and to cut off all connection with my hateful childhood. Curses on that school and all those terrible years of penile servitude. In short, I parted from my schoolfellows as soon as I got out into the world. There were two or three left, to whom I nodded in the street. One of them was Simonov, who had in no way been distinguished at school, was of a quiet and equitable disposition. And I discovered in him a certain independence of character, and even honesty I don't even suppose that he was particularly stupid. I had at one time spent some rather soulful moments with him, but these had not lasted long, and had somehow been suddenly clouded over. He was evidently uncomfortable at these reminiscences, and was, I fancy, always afraid that I may take up the same tone again. I suspect that he had an aversion for me, but still I went on going to see him, not being quite certain of it. And so, on one of these occasions, unable to endure my solitude, and knowing that as it was Thursday Anton Antonitch's door would be closed, I thought of Simonov. Climbing up to his fourth story, I was thinking that the man disliked me, and that it was a mistake to go and see him. But as it always happened that such reflections impelled me, as though purposely, to put myself into a false position, I went in. 
It was almost a year since I had last seen Simonov. End. Part 2. Chapter 2.